Hey, you're watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. Thank you for that. And also, uh, you know, so you don't have to, like, dial it all up again. Just hit that button down on the bottom that says subscribe. Never miss an episode. Wow. Very red. Beige interior. Yeah. I mean, you'll, this is why you'll always have more money than us, uh, Riz. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm Kai Rizdahl. And I'm Molly Wood. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Me. And welcome back. And welcome back to Make Me Smart, our podcast about tech, the economy, and culture, where we all help make each other smarter because none of us is as smart as all of us. And that actually literally is true today because this yep. episode would not be happening without all y'all. Yes, because remember last week when we talked about climate change I do. again, and then, which I'm going to do again today, warning. <laughs> And then a bunch of you chimed in to basically be like this. Why doesn't nuclear get more attention in green energy coverage? Totally legit, right? Exactly. And then yeah. there was something thorium, thorium, salt, salt. And we were like, you know what? <laughs> we're going to call someone. Did you go back and listen? How did you pull thorium, thorium, salt, salt out of there, man? I'm like, wow. It's just always in there. That's oh, just my how God. I love. Oh, my God. Right? Little known fact. I, I mean, really that's hit. not the technical term. We'll get to that later. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, so, but, but look, so nuclear and everybody goes, and I think this is what I did last week, although I have not gone back to, to listen is I said, oh my God, fallout and Chernobyl and terrible and, uh, three, three mile Island is what I said actually. Right. Um, yeah, both. you said both, uh, but there is more to this. So we're going to talk about the economics of it, climate change, you know, new next gen nuclear technology, if there is such a thing. Uh, and, and maybe we'll talk about public relations for the nuclear industry too. Yes, and we are bringing in an expert because, as you heard just now and also last week, we don't know <laughs> any of these answers. Lather Susie Hobbs Baker Evergreen does tweet. know, luckily. <laughs> Susie is the creative director of the Fastest Path to Zero initiative at the University of Michigan. Susie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. So, I don't know. I'm just going to jump in and say, first of all, why do... Why are people saying you can't have a conversation about meaningfully mitigating climate change without talking about nuclear? Why do we want nuclear? Well, that is the finding of the IPCC, right? The big UN reports that they put out yep. um, every few years. They have basically said to keep the planet habitable, we're going to need every tool we can get our hands on. So that includes renewables, that includes battery storage, that includes carbon capture and direct air capture, and it includes nuclear. Um, so the, the coalition of experts who help guide this process have been telling us for quite some time that we're going to need this technology. Okay, so let's get this out of the way right at the top. Number one, Chernobyl. Number two, Three Mile Island. Number three, Fukushima. And then number four, nuclear waste because that I think is the, right I mean you take the, you take the actual meltdowns and, and put them aside for two seconds just because um, there you you generate power with um, uh, nuclear energy and there's a whole leftover mm -hmm. thing that doesn't exist with other sustainable forms right wind is wind sun is sun uh, but nuclear is radioactive that's right so um, these are really legitimate concerns I just want to say that um, outright I think um, we have work to do to solve these problems. And the accidents that we've seen, um, while they're, they are few in the 60-year mm -hmm. history of this technology, when they do happen, they're really catastrophic. They're really terrifying. Um, so it's understandable that people are pretty freaked out about the potential for harm from these technologies. That said, every energy technology has risks and benefits. There's there's no technology that has zero impact. Even wind and solar, you need heavy metals that are mined, and you need hmm. concrete and construction materials. So even when the fuel is, uh, you know, wind or sun or things that we don't necessarily have to pay for, um, there are other aspects of the technology that have an impact. And so um, one of the ways in which we can better balance those risks and benefits is by thinking about how we approach and how we manage nuclear technology. So there's a ton of room for improvement. Um, what we've done so far globally um, is we've adopted one particular configuration of the technology. It's quite large. It's um, predominantly like a lot of a, a water cooled um, approach. Mm -hmm. So uh, that approach 
comes with a risk of meltdown. And we've seen that happen in a couple of places in the world and even recently in Fukushima. Um, some of the new technologies that are being developed uh, are working to specifically mitigate that risk to create configurations that won't met that won't melt down. Hmm. So um, that can mean using different types of fuels, different types of coolants, scaling down. So in an accident scenario, you just can't have that type of release. So folks are really innovating to respond to those concerns, those legitimate concerns. Well, and I want to talk more about the sort of risk part and the mm -hmm. technological development part. But before we do that, can we talk about the a little bit more explicitly about the benefits, because I think even, you know, before yeah. we came into this, when somebody asked last time, like, why aren't we talking about nuclear? And I realized I know nothing about it. Things I have learned since are that nuclear power currently supplies 20 percent of America's electricity today. And I don't and it's also way cleaner than we realized. Right. Like setting aside meltdowns and waste. That's right. Yeah. It's kind of this quiet workhorse. Um, it's just like chugging along. <laughs> And it was a climate yeah. technology before anybody was thinking about the need for climate technologies. So um, we're at why a point now. It, why is it lower carbon? Is it because it's not? I mean, is it just simply that oh, it's not burning fossil fuels? Precisely. Yeah. yeah. So fission is the process by which um, nuclear runs and it's splitting atoms. So there's no combustion factor. Um, it's just creating heat through the division of atoms. And it produces energy nonstop. There's not like some electrical. I'm just I'm getting really explicit here just in case. But there's not some yeah, there's no. no electricity required to run it. Right. It, it is it's its own virtuous right. cycle of energy production. That's right. So it produces electricity and it does that the same way that coal or natural gas produce electricity. So it generates heat. You use that heat to boil water. You use the steam from that water to spin a turbine. And the turbine produces electricity, shoots it out onto the grid. And then when you turn on your lights, when you get home, it's powering your house. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I want all the details. Yeah, Kai, yeah. your turn. <laughs> <laughs> no, de de details are good, right? Because I'm not sure everybody understands exactly how it works. Um, let me get to the to the economic nuts and bolts of this thing for a second, though. Yeah. Um, their new plants are basically... Um, non-starters, right? Because they're so unbelievably expensive in the multi tens of billions of dollars. And you can't sneeze with nuclear power without about 14 different regulatory agencies uh, getting involved. How do we get past that to um, something uh, that can sustainably contribute to the grid? That's a great question. So yeah, in the U.S., we've recently tried to construct like newer versions of these large light water reactors. And while I think that the um, there's a plant in Georgia called Vogel, and I think they will yeah. complete that unit, it sort of demonstrated that currently the conditions just aren't great for that technology. And so um, we've got to come up with solutions that can compete with natural gas. So natural gas is super cheap for a couple of yeah, reasons. Yeah. Um, the first is that it's pollution, both carbon emissions from burning it and methane, which natural gas is methane. And so when it's released in the fracking process or transportation process, that's an even more potent greenhouse gas. And the, the price doesn't reflect the cost of those emissions. Um, so we end up paying for those emissions in other ways, hmm. whether that's natural disasters, whether that's public health crises like water contamination. We are paying for it. We're just not seeing it reflected in the dollar amount of uh, the cost of natural gas. Um, the other reason it's super cheap is because there were years and years and years of highly focused federal R&D to make it cheap and to get it to the commercial market because we didn't want to import natural gas or oil from other countries. Um, and so, interestingly, there is a program that it's uh, just been created this year. It's sort of in the process of being stood up by the Department of Energy. And it was mandated by Congress um, through a bill called the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act. So a bipartisan group of folks in Congress were like, we need that same approach. We need really focused federal R&D to get this to the finish line. And we're going to do that through the creation of a National Reactor Innovation Center. Um, this year, they decided that's going to be at a Department of Energy laboratory in Idaho, the Idaho mm -hmm. National Lab. And so this process is happening again in federal R&D space where 
the federal government understands climate change is a risk. We need to transition to cleaner fuel sources, and we need technologies that can compete in economic markets against other fuel types like natural gas. Coal is sort of on its way out because of a lot of regulatory mm-hmm. factors at this point. Um, but there is that long-term vision and strategy and investment that's underway now that will ostensibly make these technologies viable and affordable in the next five to 10 years. Hmm. These technologies meaning nuclear technology. So there is, because it seems like even just a year ago, you know, when people assess the options for growing nuclear power, they basically said, as Kai said in the beginning, that this is a non-starter. It's all about just keeping existing plants from closing. Right. So that is one piece of the puzzle. Trying to keep the existing plants online, I think, is an important cause. Um, The materials assessments basically say, the regulator basically says, yeah, these can last a lot longer than we initially thought. They've been licensed for 40 years. We can probably do 80 years. And that's just super low-hanging fruit from a climate perspective. However, Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to last forever. We're going to phase out coal. We're ultimately going to need to phase out natural gas. And we need to have something in addition to renewables that can help um, carry that load. So what I'm sort of referring to now, and and you mentioned um, thorium, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a whole suite of new technologies, including thorium reactors. There are high temperature gas cooled reactors. There are micro reactors. There are these like super scaled down SMRs that use the same technology that we use now, but just in a much smaller scale. Um, And they are all racing towards commercialization. They're all really eager to fill that um, that so, opportunity in the market. So right. how long between now and when one of those is deployable at a commercial scale? So there's one company called New Scale, and they have one of these small modular reactor designs mm-hmm. that's just the same thing that we already have, but tiny. Mm-hmm. And they are working on their standard license with the NRC now with hopes of beginning construction on their demonstration unit, which will actually also be a commercial unit, um, in the next couple of years with completion in the mid-2020s. So um, that's one technology that's super close to Mm -hmm. the finish line. Mm -hmm. There are um, micro-reactors, which are really, really small, like one or two megawatt (laughs) reactors that could replace diesel generators or power um, remote communities of like 100 people, like very tiny reactors that might be on the market even faster. So I feel like this takes us straight to the PR problem. Yeah, right. Which is like, it seems like the technology path is there. The investment in R&D is there, like you said. The argument for it is clearly there. Right. At what point, though, do you start to run into the emotions and then the emotions shut things down? Because there are people who are listening to this saying, oh, my God, we're going to have tiny little nuclear reactors all over the place. You people out of your minds. Sorry, exactly. Right. Just chime yep. in, right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But no. And I actually think in Kai's brain. that <laughs> that's a fair. That's a, <laughs> I think it's a fair response. Um, I don't think that this is a PR problem. To me, this is a socio-technical problem. There are real Um, social concerns about these technologies and the track record. There are real economic hurdles. There are real political hurdles. And I think it's incumbent on the nuclear sector to solve these problems in order to build Mm -hmm. trust, in order to be able to deploy these technologies. Um, So I sort of come at this from a different way than some folks who have worked on these technologies. I think that it's much more than a PR problem. I think that we've got to demonstrate that this technology can be done safely, securely, and in ways that align to what communities want, where there's a real demand pull. Mm -hmm. Um, So an interesting example of that is actually the new scale um, reactor that I mentioned. This initial um, sort of like six or 12 modules that they're building is actually being funded by the Utah Municipal Power Association, which is a cooperative of a couple dozen municipal governments across Utah and a few in Idaho. Um, And they've created this structure in in order to fund a bunch of renewable projects over the years where they partner and they cost share. And they've been able to use this approach to work towards their climate goals. And this group is actually the first big investor in these small modular reactor technologies because 
they want to be in control of their own energy future, of their climate goals, um, of all of these sort of like community level issues. And so um, what we're seeing is that this technology is not necessarily attracting the big investor owned utilities yet. It's attracting the types of customers who have been attracted to renewable projects. It's really interesting because I hear an innovation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And it's interesting because it sounds like it, the whole nuclear conversation is not particularly pro or con. It is mostly just how, right? Like it seems clear yes. that what we're saying is yes, it's, it's a necessity. Now, how do we get everybody on board and make it safe? The end. Right? I love that. Yes. I think that's exactly right. We need it. Love it. Hate it. You know, those are all legitimate feelings, but if we've got to solve the climate crisis, then we've got to figure out how to do this in an equitable way and in a way that people want the technology. Susie Hobbs-Baker is the creative director of the Fastest Path to Zero Initiative at the University of Michigan. Her message to us today, work it out, people. Just work it out. <laughs> figure it out. Thanks, Susie, Susie. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> I don't know. Fascinating. I, it, totally fascinating. And I'm gonna work. I learned so much from I, that. I, I, I will not argue with the IPPC or IPCC. I don't know the client, the UN climate. IPCC. People. All right. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I will not argue with them. You're that still we, freaking that out. You watched it. Chernobyl too recently. Well, well, yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> but but look, I I think I mean she said it right. Susie said it. It's more than just a PR problem, right? They have to demonstrate that it can be yep. done at yeah. At scales from, you know, the, the tiny little ones out there in the communities to the big giant ones that can power, you know, New York City or whatever. And I think that's the challenge. Given the regulatory mess and the climate denying that's happening in, in the White House today and all of that, I think it's really, really tricky, which is tragic you know, for all of us. I think that's true. And I suspect that it might be one of those things that is trickier in the United States. Like I'm sort of hearkening back to our interview with Danny Kennedy. And, and one of the things that he talked about when I talked to him was was Indonesia, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a country where a lot of people are about to come online with respect to power, like don't have power currently. Yeah, and the plan sure. to get them all online is with small little diesel generators at everybody's house. Right. Right. And he's like, if that happens, then we all cook. Right. And so if micro reactors are funded and deployed there, then maybe it makes a meaningful difference. But it does become sort of um, like a solution that pops up outside of the U.S. maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Which makes yeah. sense, right? That that they've got sense. the need, right? That's the demand pull that Susie was talking about, right? They've got the need, yep. they've got the demand, and that's how it's going to happen. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Mm. Let us know. Uh, let us know what you think. Am I too gloomy? Yes, I am. But that's a whole different thing. <laughs> or, you know, is is there a way to have this conversation where it actually goes someplace? Send us a voice memo. Make me smart at marketplace.org. Um, and we'll put it on the pod. Yep. And we'll be right back. And P.S. I'm going to start saying socio-technical all the time. Okay. That was a great phrase. Okay. That's my new thing. Just All look right. for it. Okay, right. be right back. <laughs> All right, we're back, and we have to say something. I have to say something, and and I don't know how I feel about this. So Tim oh, Yar, or Jar, I apologize for this, Tim. He sent us a note that said, quote, I would just like to point out for the billionth time that we, the listeners, definitely didn't make the rule to limit the news fix to one item. This particular listener, that would be Tim, hates that rule and wants to throw his phone every time Kai brings it up, end of quote. <laughs> so, look, somebody has to have some discipline in this podcast, and it has to be me. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Only one of us said, can wait, be the free spirit. You're taking responsibility for the rule? I, sure, why not? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and yet, I couldn't help but notice. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Irony. Thy name is this podcast. <laughs> Kai has two items. Kai has I two do. items. So, he so literally do, so said you, he's the guy with so the rule. So do you. So do you. <laughs> and one of which I, I think I you would have. You would have. But I always had I not. Do. <laughs> you would have picked this had I not. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah okay. I was really happy right. that you picked. So what okay. is really? It's really shared. It's a shared. It, it's, that's right. That's shared right. item. Okay. Right. Should we start there? <laughs> yes, we should We should start there, which is this, that The Verge got its hands on a tape recording of, uh, I guess it was an all-staff meeting at Facebook that Zuckerberg took some, Zuckerberg took some questions and answers. Uh, and, and the upshot is that Zuckerberg um, is really, really irritated with Elizabeth Warren and the regulatory moves about breaking up that company and big tech in general. Um, it's a fascinating story. It is Mark Zuckerberg unplugged. It is... Um, 
I think, uh, a little telling as to how this next period of time is going to go as Warren campaigns on breaking up big tech and big tech says, wait, break up everybody else, not me. I had an interesting conversation with a friend who I like and respect who works in the tech industry, who just who was talking about, you know, the Democratic field and yeah. who he was for. And he said, you know, I, I just I would love to be for Elizabeth Warren, but I think that her plan to break up big tech just fundamentally misunderstands how technology works. And a lot of the things hmm. that actually Mark Zuckerberg said in this audio and I it, it was just it was very interesting and it made me wonder how widespread that feeling is because when you really dig into what people think about business separate from what they think about maybe capitalism right. it's right. just a really well, interesting different political calculus yeah but the capitalism conversation goes with elizabeth warren as well right because she mm -hmm. says and i'm exaggerating but not by much let's blow it all up let's tear it down to its foundations and start all over again and i think it's going to be really interesting to see um as uh she becomes and is in some polls already the front runner how that message uh, changes because she's going to have to appeal not to the Democratic base, but to more centrist people, some of whom, oh, by the way, live and work on Wall Street where there's lots of money. And she challenges them in many, many of her policies. It's yep. going to be super interesting. Yeah, it's going to be super interesting. And then when you but if you also it just made me think like if you also then you have all those Wall Street people yeah. who are absolutely going to be hell no. And then if you have all these sort of Silicon Valley liberal types mm -hmm. who are thinking, OK, mm -hmm. wait just a second. Yeah. This is where I work. Mm -hmm. This is where I live. Mm -hmm. And and you're you're coming in and sort of saying, like, the old rules apply to your new industry, that there is going to be this interesting pushback. Yeah. And yeah, and, I don't know. Anyway, this is. Yes. Sorry, mm -hmm. I got one, one more thing. The, the campaign oh. finance news out this morning about Bernie Sanders, who collected like twenty five ish million dollars in the quarter, which is to say a bazoodle full of money. He's going to be around for a very long time, which is going to pull Warren to the left as this campaign keeps going on. And again, it's going yeah. to be interesting to see what happens. It really That's is. Can we just have one of these episodes? Can't we just do like a little, just a little sneaky what? what's happening? No, our Pol producer. I feel like all no. 10 people are 10 going people like, no, absolutely, absolutely not. not. Literally, there are 10 people staring at me. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, I mean, eight, it's nine, nobody here but us now chickens on my out. end. One stepped out. Bridget, Bridget <laughs> saying one stepped out. It's fine. You know, Kai, if you want to come visit, we could do the I show know, from the right? basement. <laughs> I, I spent a fun. lot of time in a small soundproof room with people staring at me through the glass. Okay. Just anyway, here, now, now it's your turn. It's your turn. Okay. Uh, mine is also a little bit about technology, and this is a little bit of a shorty, uh, which is that just today, breaking news. I don't think I would have put this in. I wouldn't have had to today, just saying, if there weren't this. Uh, but a D.C. appellate court ruled, a, UC, a federal court ruled on Tuesday that the Trump administration uh, was can repeal existing net neutrality rules, which it did, but cannot block states from passing their own net neutrality laws. And that was like a huge part of the FCC decision to overturn the 2015 net neutrality rules mm -hmm. is that not only did it roll back sort of like every single possible protection against violations of net neutrality, it also said states can't make their own rules, which and, is and, a and, big deal. Sorry. And now just to be clear, the federal judge has said, FCC, you can't do that. We're going to let the states make their own rules. Correct. OK. All right. And it said that the FCC erred. E-R-R-E-D, when it declared that states cannot pass their own net neutrality laws, um, which and I think there are a lot of reasons that this is interesting. One is that I think it's been fascinating to watch Republicans just walk right away from states' rights. Um, as, a, as like a girl who grew up in Montana, states' rights are a big deal where <laughs> in my DNA. Um, but what I also think is interesting is that this is a localized to the United States version of the inevitable balkanization of the internet that we're going to see. And because the internet works like air in some ways, A-I-R, not E-R-R, <laughs> and is, on the phone. you know, is, is a hard thing to put in a box, I think it is going to get increasingly complicated as like California wants to have one set of rules. Uh, maybe Kansas has another set of rules. The EU has a totally different set of rules. Estonia might have some kind of rules. China's got some kind of rules. And all of these affect this digital product that is really amorphous and hard to control. And so while on the one hand, it seems totally reasonable to say states should be able to make whatever rules they want. On the other hand, it gets really complicated when you're talking about the Internet. And is it going to operate completely differently in one state versus another? 
and I just am, I think it's going to be I think it's going to get really interesting. And it's of a piece, I mean, related but but different, of the California automobile emissions and mileage standards rulings that are certainly mm-hmm. going to wind up in court, as will this one, right? What do states get to decide, and what does the federal government get to decide? Right, and California is on the verge of passing the strictest Internet privacy, digital privacy laws in the nation that would basically echo the GDPR in Europe. And then we would have to sort of figure out, well, okay, so if you live in California, you have totally different privacy rules. And does a company, and this is where you can almost hear Mark Zuckerberg, right, sitting in his all staff saying, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of how technology works because one set of pop-ups and permissions in California, like figuring out how to, the effort required to make sure that the right pop-up appears in Brussels, California, maybe Massachusetts, but not Kansas, not North Dakota, you know, not but, Iran. Like it just, but, but, it's just, but it's, it's, it's complicated. I've, it's I've, doable. Uh, it's totally possible. Well, yeah, come on. We've talked about before about how technology is, exists to solve big, big problems. These do not seem like big problems. Throw a line of code in there, bang, you're done. You get a different thing in Boston and Chicago and Calcutta. What? Just go ahead and email us, engineers. Uh, please do. <laughs> Tell about me why the quality. that's so hard. I mean, it is... I'm not saying it's not hard and I'm not saying that you don't, you cannot, you can obviously and currently and frequently get served different things based on your geography. That is 100% doable, but it is going to get more and more complicated. It's like when you hear businesses talk about how there's a patchwork of regulations and it's really hard to conform to all of them or get them all right all the time. When you're applying that to the internet, I just think it's, I, I would, I don't know, maybe I like, maybe I need to call an engineer and do this on the tech oh, show, but oh, I think it's oh, very, I just us. think it's really interesting. They will call us. <laughs> Trust me. They will. That's true. They're not uh, going to call. They're going to text. They're going to text or, you know, plant a virus on our computers or something. I don't know. No, engineers <laughs> are good guys. All right. So uh, my turn now. I, I want to do a quickie. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the re- yeah. Go. The, the recession is a coming, folks. And you know how I know that? I know that because a group called the Institute for Supply Management said so this morning, but not in as many words. There was a report out today called the ISM Purchasing Manufacturing Index, which came out this morning, um, which shows that manufacturing for the second month in a row in this economy has slowed precipitously to levels not seen since, wait for it, June of 2009. Now, Mm. the United States is not a manufacturing economy solely, but it is big, it is important, and it is a sign of things to come. So that's it. Outlook is gloomy. (laughs) Okay, so ironically, my second thing is also exactly about that. It's almost like we really? planned this. Uh-huh. You're talking about because the ISM? No. Oh. Sorry. Mine is also about uh, how recession is a coming and uh, financial risk okay. and stability. So there was a story in the New York Times. Uh, some research came out on late Sunday, early Monday, about how risky mortgages, mortgages that are risky as a result of climate change. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah represent a serious financial threat yep. to the stability of banks yep. and that in maneuvers that seem eerily familiar to what was happening in 2008 uh, in subprime lending, these banks are shifting these more these risky mortgages, say 60 to $100 billion in mortgages on coastal homes mm-hmm. over to the federal mortgage operators, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So that taxpayers will have to sort of bear the burden of foreclosures that occur when houses are destroyed in hurricanes or increased flooding. And that, so you have this sort of like double whammy. One, that they're shifting the risky mortgages, subprime lending style. Mm -hmm. And two, that they still hold billions of dollars in mortgages that are at extreme risk of default because of climate change. Right. And since we're not a manufacturing economy, but we are pretty uh, housing economy dependent, it seems like yet another bad news moment. It is a bad news moment. And and it's bad news not just because of the scale of the mortgage, not because of, rather, the scale of these mortgages inside the housing market, right? I mean, $100 billion worth of mortgages is is pocket change, right? But the fact that they are securitizing it out and laying it off on the taxpayers is not a promising sign for the the diligence and and, um, rigor with which uh, the financial sector is approaching its job. Uh, and that's exactly yep. right. God, and then when you <sighs> combine that with that story in the Wall Street Journal about how people are getting seven-year car loans because their cars are so unaffordable, oh, this is not... <laughs> I went to the dark place. I want is, this the first, is this the first time on a Hollywood dark place thing? <laughs> what? What? Now you know how uh, I feel, pal. Now you know how I feel. I need a nap. All right. 
All right, one more thing before we get to your comments. Uh, We are gear. If we have raised more questions than we have answered, (laughs) now is your chance. (laughs) Look, there's a case to be made that if we're doing our jobs right, we are raising more questions than we're answering. That's the whole point, so that you can email us and be like, wait, 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 everything you said about states and the internet is wrong. Can you uh, get an expert on? Anyway, we're gearing up for another explain-a-thon, and so we need... Your questions, we email do. them to us. We Make do. me smart at marketplace.org. Anything you want to know about anything, uh, Tony Wagner will look up the answers for us. <laughs> yeah. If we don't already know them, so which here, hopefully we will. Here's the way it works, right? And if you've been listening for a while, you know this. You guys send in your questions. Molly and I basically answer them cold. Okay, basically no prep. We got one pass, and if we can't figure it out, we're going to pass it off to Tony, and he's going to look it up, and we'll put it on the show page. We did one back in April, episode 108, Tony wants us to note here, um, and we will put a link to that in the show notes. Um, Send us your questions. Voice memos are better just because us reading your emails is not great audio, frankly. Um, Make me smart at marketplace.org. Yep, try to stump us. Try to stump us, and then we'll do, you'll hear it in episode 108. Pass to Tony. That's when we need help. Okay, your turn. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. So gig economy is what we're going to talk about first. We talked about uh, the gig economy um, not too long. Was it last week, two weeks? I don't even know. Um, And we asked people who liked being in the gig economy to write and tell us why. Andrew Miller uh, sent us this. I'm a 31-year-old, married for nine years with four kids, double baccalaureate whose anchor job is a uh, city manager just outside of Houston, Texas. The anchor job is paying the bills, but not much beyond that. Between medical debts, student loans, car payments, house payments, and just life in general, there are days where it seems our heads are just barely above water. I've been working as a gig worker, a personal grocery shopper for a little over a year now Mm. as a way to both accelerate paying down our high interest debts and also give us some breathing room. We've already started talking with the kids about places they want to go and things they want to do once our finances free up and with answers ranging from go bowling to go to Legoland, (laughs) we're all grateful for the gig economy in the future. It's affording us years ahead of when it would be available to us if I only worked a traditional nine to five. A comment Mm. uh, and a piece of advice. Number one, I would really like to know how much you make as a personal grocery shopper. That would be of interest to me. Number two, do not go to Legoland. Just don't. (laughs) It's it's so not worth it. Truly. I was waiting for the like the serious advice. That's true though, by the way. The only fun part is like the swimming pool thing that they have there with the water slides. Yep. Everything else is kind of horrific. Yeah. Um, this, I feel, this comment, thank you, Andrew, for sending this in, is both telling and heartbreaking because th- this is, like, the amount that has been piled on people versus right. the amount that people are getting paid is yeah. exactly why right. the, the gig economy is needed. And so, of course, we're at a point where we're sort of grateful for the opportunity to make this extra money when... There is also the argument to be made that, man, you shouldn't have to. Right. It's, you know, I mean, he's in a professional job, college educated, right? And here he is, yep. you know, personal grocery shopping. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Tells you a lot about wage yeah. growth in yep. America. Um, elsewhere in that episode, when we were talking about California's AB5 law, I was wondering uh, if there was a third way, if there was something between independent contractors who are on your own, hanging out in the wind, and employees who are sort of locked in for life. Listener Derek Perry wrote in with The View from Canada. Hi, Kai and Molly. In your latest episode, Molly mentioned that it would be nice if there was something in between a full-time employee and an independent contractor. And as I understand it, in Canada, they do have something in between those two. They call it a dependent contractor, Hmm. where if you are dependent on a single company for your livelihood, you can get uh, certain benefits as if you were a full-time employee while still maintaining your contractor status. And so it may be a good idea for the United States to take a play out of the Canadian playbook in that regard. Totally fascinating. And we looked it up and and it turns out there are some benefits, but really the the tangible ones uh, right now are that your employer has to give you reasonable notice of termination. Also, you get severance pay. Um, So, you know, like it's a start, but there's there's Mm -hmm. huge problems in that whole economy, actually. Right. It's a start as a 
category, yeah, the idea sure. of dependent, like dependent contractor, contractor yeah. that's really interesting. But yeah, yeah. because of the <laughs> because of the profound difference in just healthcare, right. I'm gonna say like our solutions are gonna have to involve some sort of pooled benefit structure yeah. that, as far as I know, I don't think exists anywhere else. However, thank you because awesome, good tip, Derek. All right, we have one more call from listener Emily Dilger. It is not about gig workers, maybe Dilger, um, but it is extremely germane. So here we go. Hi, Molly and Kai. I've been noticing many more men's voices in the listener feedback section, and I imagine that might be more reflective of who sends you recordings versus who listens. So I challenged myself to send you a recording, and I encourage my fellow female listeners to do the same. I started my career in academia, in the biomedical sciences, where it always felt to me like people compete on how much they know, how many papers they can reference off the top of their head, how many connections they can come up with. Later, I switched to community and education work, where it's felt less about what I know and more about empathy and understanding. It's more about working with the people than for them. So maybe, in short, I've learned that none of us is as smart as all of us. Is that kissing up too much? But it's true. No, it's not. It's totally Aww. not kissing up too much. Oh, so a combination gosh. of her answer to the make me smart question, which is, of course, yes. what is something you thought you knew and you later found out you were wrong about? And also, yes, ladies, I know you're listening because I know that a whole bunch of my friends listen in all sincerity on their commutes and always have comments to me personally. And if you were sitting there yelling to the dog or talking to the windshield, like record it. <laughs> Record it and send it to us because I know, I mean, I really do know and I'm proud of the fact that this podcast has a varied listenership and we definitely don't only want to hear from the men. No offense. No, I, we want to hear from you too. I have no friends and they never tell me I'm listening. They're listening. Oh, <sighs> anyway. do you want me to send you some of my friends? No, you know what? Come hang out fine. in the basement. I'll have all yeah, my friends right. come listen. We're going right. to have a super fun time. Here, here is the truth though. And, and <laughs> the, the actual numbers show that we do have more men writing in than women. So cut that out. Yep. Let's, let's change cut that. that out. Women write yes. to us. Yes. All <laughs> right. Before we go, before, before we get into a little like hug circle, uh, we want to say that actually this is a hug circle. I totally lied. Cause here it comes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone. You did it. Have you seen the video? Oh, <laughs> Everyone who donated to our fall fundraiser got us to the goal early on Wednesday morning. And I believe that Make Me Smart pushed us over the top. It might have been some of Kai's <laughs> tweets, but I still want to believe in the power of the podcast. So so we had gone out and said, look, if you give us $50,000, which will be matched by the Candida Fund, uh, I will drink a pumpkin spice latte and I'll do it on video. Uh, and holy cow, you guys delivered. Uh, $73,810 was the net. That's more than $20,000 over what we had asked for, which is kind of amazing. And as I said amazing. in the video, had I known that this was actually going to work, I'd have asked for more money. That's all I'm saying. Um, so, <laughs> well, you did, and yeah. now you're on the hook. I, I know, right? Well, uh -huh. so, so next year is pumpkin spice beer, and it's $100,000 as the opening bid. That's all I'm saying. Yep. Um, yep. Yes. Yes. Check and it, it out. And it was matched... By yeah, the Candida matched. Fund, yeah. which means like yeah. this is meaningful, yeah, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Like this is money. meaningful money to our operation. And and not to mention Kai having to drink a PSL and he got like a little whipped cream on his nose. And, and, no and can I just him. say, by the way, so it's, <laughs> it's the most vile concoction. It is so, I was like barfy for an hour and a half. It was so, oh. so gross. I don't Are understand you lactose why people intolerant? do that. No, and there's probably not any <laughs> lactose in the freaking thing. It's all chemicals. You're out of your mind? Have you ever had one? Gotten, have you had one? Yeah, I used to really love them, and I do believe that they've Ew. gotten more chemical tasting over yeah. the time, over the years. Yeah. And now I've switched completely to the white chocolate mocha. Oh, the so the mint. Sorry, like the it. mint. The mint mocha that they have during the holidays. It's that's, delicious. That's no better. It's I'm no sure better. they're going to roll it out any second now. Now that it's October. Explainathon questions, people. Send them in. Send them in. Make Send me them in. Marketplace.org. Voicemail, please, or voice memos. Yep. All right, we're going. But I mean, listen, we'll, we'll take your emails. If you're just nervous. No, you no, can, we'll e no. We'll, we'll read an Cowboy email. Cowboy up. <laughs> Cow lady up. Cow, Cow lady. person. Cow person. <laughs> Whatever. All also subscribe to our newsletter, yes. marketplace.org slash newsletters. And thank you for the save, producers. Yes. That's why you got nine people there yes. looking out. Make Me Smart was produced and directed this week by Sam Anderson. He's Sam. new. Welcome to the show. With production help from Tony Wagner, our senior producer is Eve Tro, and this is her last episode because she's going to be sporty. 
More on that later. Eve, thank you for everything. <laughs> we're we're going to have more on that later? What are we going to do? Production what oversight. For produ- I don't know if I'm allowed to say it or doing? not what she's doing. Oh, okay. I don't want to, like, right. get her in trouble. But okay. anyway, good luck and thank you for everything. <laughs> We also had production help oversight from Bridget Bonner this week. Thanks to our video producers, Ben Hathcote and Summer Dunsmore. Charlton Thorpe had the great professional pleasure of engineering this program today. Our theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez, the executive director of On Demand until she quits after hearing this is Tarnieves, the senior vice president <laughs> and general manager, already probably out the door, is Deborah Clark. <sighs> Giving up on us completely. There we go. Completely. We're, oh We're fired. God. Why would we get fired? We didn't do anything. That was awesome. There we go.